She was hot. She was hot, and she knew it. The two girls with her were not bad, but they didn't even come close to her. An endless stream of guys headed to her table, and after a couple of minutes of conversation, she sent them on their way. Football players, baseball players, and all the other athletes wanted to sit with her at the school cafeteria table, but she turned them all away. I sat and watched and wished I had the courage to try, but if she didn't want anything to do with the school's elite, what chance did a bookworm like me have? Not one, I thought, not a chance. Bobby is a bookworm. It was me, the guy with the worst case of acne, the guy who sat in the back of the classroom, a she guy who kept to himself. Two years have passed and Bobby, the bookworm, has fixed a few things. The acne was gone, but my face was so scarred and pitted that it looked like it had been walked on by a golfer wearing spiked boots. I was a shy guy, and I was still sitting in the school cafeteria looking across the room at the table where she was sitting with her two friends. And then the strangest thing happened. She looked in my direction, our eyes met, and she smiled at me. I knew it as surely as I knew my own name. She didn't smile in my direction. She didn't smile while looking into space. She smiled at me. The bell rang, signaling the end of the lunch period and breaking the spell, and we all stood up and walked to our next class. I didn't have any afternoon activities with her. I saw her again in the first two classes the next day. I thought she glanced in my direction once or twice, but I was probably mistaken. I was sitting alone at a table in the cafeteria, as usually happened when she and her two friends stood in line. I, like everyone else, watched her pay the cashier. She then looked around for an empty table, and everyone was watching to see where they would go. It was the sexiest thing in the world. The cashier gave her the change, and she looked around the room. There were several empty tables on the east side of the room, and none on the side where I was sitting, although there were three empty seats at my table. She turned and walked towards the empty seats at my table, and behind her, I saw her two friends looking at each other in confusion before following her. She came to my table, looked at me, and said, Can we join you? I was too stunned to say a word, but she knew the odds of me saying no were like the moon actually being a big piece of cheese, so she sat down. She looked at me and said, Robert, right? I nodded affirmatively. So tell me, Robert, why do you sit here every lunch and watch me like a hawk? Her friends looked from her to me and then back to her again, and what the hell is going on here was as clear on their faces as it was in my mind. I was shy, but it was that shyness that stopped me from getting close to people. But I'm not tongue-tied. I smiled and said, Beauty attracts the eye. Extreme beauty attracts the eye and holds it. This seemed to surprise her. Wasn't this idiot a slack-jawed clown? I had no idea what she was thinking at that moment. I wasn't the kind of guy who was privy to the thoughts of a goddess. She gave me a dazzling smile and asked, If this is true, why did you never come to talk to us? What? I? Will a commoner approach the throne? She laughed and said, we could handle a steady diet of this kind of flattery, right, girls? Her two friends, Carol and Bev, smiled wryly, clearly indicating that they had no idea what was going on. Seriously, she said, why haven't you ever talked to me before? I can turn this against you. We have been in the same class for more than three years. Why didn't you ever talk to me? Because I am the queen bee, and all the males should approach me, and not I should approach them. And then she laughed and said, The truth is that I was a rather shallow, arrogant fool. I was so used to all the handsome guys fawning over me that I never paid much attention to guys who looked like you. At these words, Bev and Carol caught their breath. She laughed again and said, I am the queen, and the queen can say whatever she pleases. She looked me straight in the eyes and said, You know what you look like, so you're not surprised that I see you the same way, right? I shrugged and said, no, not really. Fine, we start without illusions. Begin? That's right, Bob. Let's start. Meet me after school and you can take my books home. Carry your books? Figure of speech, Robert. I usually go out the east door. Then she changed the topic to who to vote for for prom king and queen, and we talked over lunch. When the bell rang, she said, East door at three. See you there. She walked away.
leaving me to sit and wonder what the hell just happened. Stupefied? Yes. Stupid? No. At three o'clock I was standing on the steps at the east door when she came out. Bev and Carol were with her, and when they saw me waiting, I saw them look at each other. Each silently asked, Do you know what's going on here? But there was no surprise on her face when she saw me, because she knew I would be there. She handed me her book bag, and I took it. At the bottom of the stairs she turned right, but I took her hand and led her left. She looked at me questioningly, and I said, Be patient, my queen. Everything will become clear soon. We walked to the student parking lot and a 1993 Ford Mustang convertible. I opened the passenger door, bowed deeply, and said, The carriage is served, my queen. Neither of us had seen the car before, which wasn't too strange since I hadn't seen it myself until last night. It was my 18th birthday, but it was decided that we would celebrate it on Saturday, so I didn't expect anything until then. Mom told me to take out the trash while she prepared dinner, and Dad got out the plates and dishes to set the table. I walked out the door into the attached garage where the trash cans were and stopped in my tracks when I saw a sea-green Mustang with a white convertible top. It had a huge red bow and ribbon that said, Happy Birthday, Rob. I just stood and looked at him. Mom and Dad came up behind me. Mom said, Happy Birthday, dear. And Dad said, The color is a little nasty, but you're young enough for it to suit you. Mom hit him with her fist and said, Shut up. It's beautiful. And I'm mad that you didn't give it to me and give Rob my clunky van. I can't give it to you, said Dad. If you go in this car, I'll have to fight off everyone with a stick, and I'm too old for this shit. Mom laughed and said, You're kind of old and decrepit. Maybe Rob will lend me a car one evening, and I can go on a cruise and find some stud to keep up with me. Dad said, I'll show you the old and decrepit one. And he picked her up, put her on his shoulder, and carried her towards the bedroom, and she laughed and told him to put her down. I held the door open so Bev and Carol could sit in the back and she climbed into the white leather seat in front while I lowered the lid. I started the engine, turned to her, and said, Where would my queen like to go? This is how my relationship with Melissa and Courtney began. We headed to Bev's house and then to Carol's, and she said she would call them later. As soon as we were alone, she said, Why don't we drive through the driveway, drink a couple of Cokes, and go to the park? I listen and obey my queen. She laughed and said, I should have found you earlier. I've been here all this time. Tell me about yourself. Nothing to tell. I'm a little shy and mostly keep to myself, except for half a dozen really good friends. Basically, I go to school, study, and spend time in the library three to four times a week. Why spend so much time in the library? I'm part of a chess club that meets there on Tuesdays, and a book discussion group that meets there on Thursdays. On Wednesdays, I read books to a group of four, five, and six-year-olds. I notice that you don't play sports. Yes, I'm not attracted to competitions. I play tennis with my mom on the weekends and sometimes bowl with my dad, but most of the time I work out in the gym that my dad built in our basement. But enough about me. Why did the queen consider this insignificant commoner worthy of her attention? She was silent for a moment, and just as she was about to say something, we pulled up to the burger barn and pulled into the driveway. I ordered two nice lunches and then drove across the street to the park, got out, went to the picnic table, and sat down. She took a bite of her hamburger and took a sip of cola and then said, The truth may hurt, but considering how you took my comment about your appearance, I think you can handle it. You could say I'm a shallow, arrogant fool, and that's true, but I never realized it. I didn't need to realize it because I was too busy being adored and fawned over. Boys flocked to me from the age of 12, and I had a choice. If the one I chose turned out to be a toad, so what? Just leave him and choose someone else. I never had a shortage of dates and didn't care, and this could have gone on forever if I hadn't overheard a conversation between mom and dad. I shouldn't have been in the house. I was supposed to stay the night with Carol, but she got sick, so I went home. Apparently, my parents didn't hear me come in and were talking about me. My father was worried about my future if I didn't change my habits. He noted that all my boyfriends were empty-headed jocks, 
and if you took the last five, I dated and put all their brains together. You still couldn't see them without a microscope. He said the only reason any of them spent any time studying at all was because they had to maintain a C average or they couldn't play sports. Mom said it's not that bad, and besides, I'm still young and having fun, as I should at my age. My dad says it's true, but he's afraid I'll take my taste for boys with me when I go off to college this fall and end up with some idiot whose only desire is to play pro ball. I went up to my room, thought about what he said, and realized that he was right. The only guys I dated were handsome athletes. Many were not as stupid as my father made them out to be, but almost all of them were interested in sports, and it seemed like that was all they talked about. When I worked out, it was never with the guy I was dating at the time. It was always with Bev, Carol, or a couple of other girlfriends. I tried to remember the last time I had a meaningful conversation with one of my boyfriends, but I couldn't remember one. My father was right. I chose my boyfriends based on looks alone, and it dawned on me that the reason I was changing boyfriends so quickly was because other than looks, they had nothing to attract and hold my interest. I thought about it for a couple of days and decided that I needed to see how the other half was doing. I looked around and saw you. I wanted to get away from the delicious, handsome guys. I wanted someone that my dad didn't think was just another jerk, and like I said, you were there. But even so, you're lucky. I noticed you yesterday, sitting alone at lunch, and I thought, wow, Lissa, this is the perfect guy. Not the prettiest or the athlete, but he's on the honor roll every semester, so I headed over to your desk and here we are. So what do you think of your queen now? So I'm a social experiment. Why don't we tell you that you are participating in the project? A project? Yes, the project is to try to change the narcissistic, arrogant, superficial fool into something else. Are you up to this task? Most likely no. She raised an eyebrow and I said, You said it yourself about four hours ago that you never paid much attention to guys who looked like me. The problem is that you are not the only girl with this attitude. I'm 18 and have never been on a date with a girl and not for lack of trying. I don't have the slightest idea how I can help with your project. You're kidding me, right? Not in the least. I've never met a girl who wanted to date a guy whose face looked like he'd had a cheese grater on it. She sighed and shook her head. Melissa used to be one of them. I think there are two projects to work on right now. Two projects? Yeah, me and you. You'll be working on the Reassembling Melissa project, and I'll be working on the Transforming Robert into a Social Butterfly project. Maybe they are related. Can you dance? My mom forced me to take dance lessons when I was in seventh grade. And then, at home with mom, he and my father competed in ballroom dancing. When he goes on business trips... She wants to dance to fill her evenings. Then, it's okay. The first step in what I'll call the Bobby Project is to get other guys involved on dates. The goal will be for you to be ready to shine at prom. At graduation? I don't have a date for prom. I don't even know anyone I could invite to prom. Every girl I've ever asked out has turned me down. Of course you have a date, silly. It's just that you haven't made an official proposal to me yet. You? Will you be my prom date? Depends on the circumstances. From what? A stupid little demand known as asking. I looked at her, stunned, and she said, Repeat after me, Robert. Will you go to the ball with me, Melissa? I stared at her in complete confusion. How could this happen? Having the prettiest and most popular girl in school sitting on a park bench talking to me was mind-boggling in itself. It defied all logic that she told me to invite her to the ball. Come on, Robert, you can handle it. Just follow me. Will you go to the ball with me, Melissa? I pinched myself and felt pain, so I knew it was not a dream. I took a breath and asked, Miss Courtney, would you do me the honor of allowing me to accompany you to the prom? I thought you'd never ask. Of course, yes. Now that we've settled everything, we need to see your mother. With my mom? For what? If she has participated in ballroom dancing competitions, she knows how important it is to be synchronized partners. We need her to see us together so she can make her comments and suggestions. 
As you noted, Robert, I am the queen, and the queen will have to reign supreme at the prom. When is the right time? I'll ask when I get home. She looked at me, and I found that she was quite good at reading facial expressions. What are you thinking about, Robert? I find it hard to believe that this close to prom, the prettiest and most popular girl in my senior year doesn't have a partner yet, but mostly I find it hard to believe that you want to go to prom with me. Half a dozen guys asked me, and I turned them down because it was hard for me to choose between them. I already told you why I never dated one guy for very long, and all the guys who asked me out were the same as the ones I kept changing. They were all cut from the same cloth, from the same mold, so to speak. Graduation should be special, and I was hoping for something better. Then I reevaluated, and here we are. As your queen, I am going to give you a task. Your queen's prom is special. Do this, and your queen may give you a knighthood, or kiss you and turn you from a frog to a prince. Let your queen down, and she may leave you a frog forever. I listen and obey my queen. She laughed. You're a big idiot. I should have checked the frog sooner. I took her home and walked her to the door. She kissed me on the cheek and told me she would see me at school the next day. Over dinner, I told my mom that I had a prom date and that Melissa wanted some help with our dance. Mom offered to bring her home after school. I called Melissa and she didn't have any plans for the day and was looking forward to dancing with me. Melissa and I had two classes together in the morning, and at the end of the second, she told me to save her a seat at my table during lunch. When I sat down in the dining room, it seemed like everyone was looking at me, and I wondered what it was. I learned this when Melissa and the ever-present Bev and Carol joined me at the table. Melissa told the guys who asked her out that she wouldn't go to prom with them. She told Carol, Bev, and a few other kids that she was going with me, and word of the school spread the news. Melissa asked me if I would mind if Carol and Bev came with her to my house. At three o'clock I was waiting for them at the east door, and we went to my house. Mom and Melissa seemed to hit it off instantly. And after some small talk, Mom said, Okay, you two, let's see what you have there. We entered the living room with a wooden floor. My mother put on the CD we used to dance to and turned it on. The first number was a waltz, and it immediately became clear that Melissa could not dance. I mean, she could dance like most teenagers, but she wasn't up to ballroom dancing standards. I made her look bad. Not at all what I wanted for my queen. Mom said, You need to do some work, honey. Let me show you what it should look like. She held out her hand to me and pressed play again, and I led my mother around the hall until the tune ended. Then Mom said, We need to do one of two things. Either Bobby needs to dance more quietly, or we need to get you up. I vote to raise me, Melissa said. How can I do it? Hard work, honey. Hard work and time. How much time do you have? Every minute when I'm not at school. Including weekends. What do we have? Two weeks until graduation? Melissa nodded affirmatively. Then, it's okay. Every evening after school and all day on Saturday. If we achieve good results, we will be able to skip Sundays. She turned to me and said, This means that you will be in charge of preparing dinner when your father returns home. Are you all right? No problem. He cooks? Melissa asked. My Bobby is a man of many talents. Sooner or later, some very lucky young lady will understand what he is like. I blushed, and Mom told me that I wouldn't be needed for the afternoon lesson, but to be ready to work hard the next day. As I headed into the kitchen, I heard Bev ask if she and Carol could watch. I didn't hear what my mom said, but I was sure she would be okay. While I was driving the girls home, they were talking about dresses and other prom-related things, and at Melissa's door, I received another kiss on the cheek, and she told me to remember to save her a seat at my table the next day. The next day I was late for lunch, and when I got there, Melissa, Carol, and Bev were already sitting at the table, but the fourth seat was taken by Ray Hendricks, so I found a seat at the other end of the cafeteria. Melissa showed up at the east door alone at three o'clock that afternoon, and as we drove to my house, she apologized for not leaving me a seat at the table. Ray sat down before I could tell him I was saving a seat for you. He talked to Bev about their prom date so I couldn't send him away. I shrugged and we pulled into the driveway. 
We were just entering the house when I found out why Carol and Bev weren't with Melissa when she left school. Ray pulled up to the house, and he and Bev got out of the car as Carol and Steve Miller pulled up behind him. I looked at Melissa. Your mom said she would also be working with Bev, Carol, and their bows. I just shrugged and said, I think the Queen's Court should look good. And we entered the house. Mom was in her element. She's like a dance instructor, just waiting to come out of the closet. She spent the day showing the basics, using me as a visual aid, about an hour before Dad was due home. And then I had to head into the kitchen and start preparing dinner. When Dad got home, he was working with Mom in class, and around 6.30 it was all over, and Mom came and told me that Melissa was staying for dinner. Dad almost completely dominated the conversation at the dinner table, asking Melissa about herself, her family, what she planned to study in college, and what her goals in life were. When dinner was over, he said he would clean up so I could work with Mom and Melissa. At nine, I drove Melissa home, and as soon as we pulled away from my house, she said, Okay, Robert, go ahead. What? Why did you have such a long face when Ray and Steve came with Bev and Carol? I spent most of my school years with girls who had almost nothing in common with me, and then my fairy godmother took pity on me and waved her magic wand. The magic dust has settled, and here you are. This is the only possible explanation. And just like the fairy godmother gives Cinderella only until midnight, I know that I will only have a short time with you, and I think I don't want to share the little time I have with anyone else. To this she did not answer, but what could she say? She knew it was true. I walked her to the door, and she turned to me with a strange look on her face as she said she would see me at school the next day. She leaned over and kissed me, not on the cheek, but on the lips. Then she turned and went inside. When I got home, Dad said he'd order pizza for dinner tomorrow and take care of all the kitchen chores on Saturday so I could have more time to work with Melissa. I think you have a good girl, and we should do everything possible to keep her with you. On Friday at lunch, all the talk was about dances and prom dresses. Then I was asked what dances I thought would be played. I said it was more likely that half would be waltzes and the rest up-tempo numbers based on current popular tunes and I assumed there would be at least one each of tango, cha-cha, and samba. Do we have time to study them? Carol asked. Maybe some basics, I replied. Of course Carol had to bring it up that evening, and of course Mom took it as a challenge. How hard do you want to work? She asked. Today we can work late, and tomorrow all day. You'll need to be here most of the day on Sunday, and then work a couple more hours the following week. We have tonight all of this weekend and all of next week and weekend. I think we can do it, but you won't have time for anything else. I could tell Ray and Steve weren't interested in it, but Melissa, Carol, and Bev were all for it, so Ray and Steve trudged along. It was either that or lose your girlfriends 13 days before graduation. We worked until 10, and then I took Melissa home. We had almost reached Melissa's house when she said, Your queen is furious. And what, pray tell, did this insignificant one do to upset his queen? We haven't been on a date yet. We spent all this time together and still haven't gone on a date. This humble man apologizes, but at the risk of incurring the wrath of his queen, he must say that it was the queen who made the decision to fill all her free time with dancing lessons. She looked at me for a moment before saying, I guess what I did was wrong. Before I got to her house, she told me to turn left onto Jerry Street. Why are we doing this? Be patient, you'll see. She made me turn right, and I looked at her questioningly, because we were at a dead end. At the end of the block, she told me to stop and park. I did as she said, and then she said, sit in the back. When she left her side and moved towards the back door, I followed her. It doesn't look like we can find time to go on a date before graduation, and I'll be damned if I wait another 13 days to do it. We can't do it in the front because of the bucket seats, center console, and shifter, so we'll have to do it here. Kiss me. Was I going to argue? You weren't joking when you said that there were no girls in your life. If they did, they certainly didn't teach you how to kiss. Here, let me show you. And she did it. After a couple of minutes, she said, Not bad, but we'll have to spend some time working on this. 
and then tried to find my lips again. Another half hour passed before she said it was time for me to take her home. The kiss goodbye at the front door was a little tense, and I drove home, thanking my fairy godmother profusely. It may not last long, but I will have very pleasant memories. The next ten days passed the same way. On Saturdays and Sundays, we worked twelve hours a day under the supervision of an overseer who became my mother. There was school from Monday to Friday, and after school there were four more hours of lessons. The following Saturday and Sunday were also twelve hours. Every night when I drove Melissa home, we kissed. Sometimes it seemed to me that Melissa was expecting some action from me, but I didn't know what. When I got home from driving Melissa home from Sunday's session, my mom told me that she thought Melissa and I were almost good enough to compete. You were always ready, baby, but Mel needs some more work. Carol would also be happy if she had a better partner, but unfortunately, Bev and Ray don't have what it takes. They will shine at prom, but it will be because most of the other kids don't get their lessons. Do you really think we're doing that good? I bet, baby. I went to bed that night feeling damn good. This good feeling stayed with me until the end of the fourth hour. At the end of the second hour of class, Carol asked me to meet her at the east door before heading to the cafeteria for lunch. I was there waiting when she came out. She came up to me and hesitated. She wanted to say something, but didn't seem to know what or how to say it. I tried to help. Come on, Carol. As you can imagine, I'm used to hearing bad news from girls. I can handle it. Mel is my best friend, and I don't usually interfere in her affairs, but over the past couple of weeks, I've realized what a wonderful guy you are and what a wonderful family you have. I wouldn't want to, but I'm afraid Mel will hurt you. I know why she hangs out with you, but I also know her, Rob. I know you're not the kind of guy who will hold her interest for long. She'll use you to satisfy some need she feels she has, and then she'll dump you like a dozen others. I see the way you look at her, Rob, and I know how you will feel when this happens. All this touches my heart much more than I could have imagined. I guess I hope that if I prepare you for this, it will help in some way. I appreciate your concern, Carol, but I'll be fine. I always knew it wouldn't last long. At least I'll have prom, and that wouldn't have happened before Melissa became interested in me for some reason. This raises another question. You know you'll only be able to spend part of the prom with her, right? What do you mean? She will definitely be elected prom queen, and Dick Harbour will most likely be named prom king, and they will have to spend some time together. There is a queen's court there, and tradition says that she must dance with all the men in her court. I shrugged and said, At least in the record books I'll be your date and our photo will be in the class yearbook. This is something I will always have. Let's go. We'll be late for lunch. That evening after our dance class, I drove Melissa home, and as soon as I pulled out of the driveway, Melissa said, I saw Carol talking to you today. What does all of this mean? I hesitated, and she said, Come on, honey, you can tell me. Carol and I are too close for anything you say to me to affect us. She says she loves me and doesn't want me to suffer. And what? She more or less told me not to get too close to you. Why would she do this? The idea was that if I didn't get too close, it wouldn't hurt as much when you abandoned me and moved on to your next conquest. And you think this will happen? Considering my history with the opposite sex, why not? You are a queen, and I am a simple serf, and we, simple serfs, know better than to try to climb too high. Pull over to the side of the road. What? Stop the damn thing. I had never heard a single obscene word from her, so I was shocked, but still stopped at the side of the road. She turned around, climbed over the center console and the gear shift, turned off the ignition, and kissed me. The kiss turned into a hot makeout session. She lifted the sweater, grabbed my right hand, and placed it on her chest, and then put one hand on my manhood and rubbed it. I've never done this with other guys. None of the studs and hunks I've dated have ever gotten it. You are special, Robert, and you are my boyfriend. You're stuck with me, idiot, so get used to it. It was a good idea, even if I didn't believe it. Tuesday and Wednesday flew by quickly, and it was graduation night. 
I was heading to the garage to pick up the Mustang when my dad said, where are you going? To pick up my car. Your car is ahead. I walked up to the front door and saw a long limo parked at the curb. He handed me $200 bills and said, go ahead. When I got to Melissa's house and she came downstairs to greet me, she was so beautiful that it almost took my breath away. If I experienced nothing else, I at least saw this vision approaching me. I had to pose for photos as Melissa's mom took 20 or 30 pictures with her camera, and she told me she would make a set for my mom as I walked Melissa to the door. You might want my queen to get into her chariot, I said, opening the front door, and Melissa walked out onto the porch and saw the limousine. I hope he doesn't turn into a pumpkin before I get you home. Melissa turned and kissed me with a kiss that made me weak in the knees, and her mother took the photo. Could you make me a thousand copies of this book? I asked, and her mother laughed. All eyes were on us as we entered. Half the audience was probably thinking, what the hell is she doing with him? And most of the men present revealed her beauty and dreamed of being in my place. Melissa, Carol, Bev, Ray, Steve, and I dazzled the rest of the crowd as we dove and spun. Melissa truly became prom queen, and Carol and Bev became part of her court. The biggest surprise was that Dick Harbour did not become king. Instead, the honor went to Micah Shell, one of Melissa's ex-boyfriends. The biggest shock came when it was time for the king and queen to dance. Mike smiled widely as he approached Melissa as the orchestra began to play a waltz. The smile disappeared as Melissa reached over, took the crown off his head, walked over to me, placed it on my head, and led me to the dance floor. Just the two of us, alone on the floor, and all eyes are on us. If we were to participate in a dance competition during this dance, we would sweep the floor along with the other participants. We felt so good together. When the music finally stopped, Melissa and I bowed to each other, and the room erupted into thunderous applause. I later found out that the leader of the group played the waltz for an extra three minutes because we were dancing so well that he didn't want to stop us. Melissa took the crown off my head and gave it back to Mike, then led him out onto the dance floor for the next dance. Carol came up to me, elbowed me in the ribs, and said, Show off. Now it's my turn. I danced with Carol and Bev and a few other girls that night because I couldn't keep Melissa with me all evening, but she was with me more than half the time. There were one or two other bright spots. When the band played the cha-cha, Mom's students were the only ones on the dance floor, and when they played the second one half an hour later, Mom's students each grabbed a partner from the crowd and led them onto the dance floor and tried to lead them through the dance. The same thing happened when the orchestra played two tangos. The first was just mom's team, and the second was mom's team pulling partners out of the crowd. During the second tango, I pulled Nancy Newbert onto the dance floor, and when I tried to lead her through the dance, she said, Damn, Rob, where the hell have you been hiding? I almost laughed in her face. I've asked her out at least half a dozen times since we were in ninth grade together, and she always sweeps me off my feet. I just smiled and remained silent. The last dance was a waltz, and all was right in my world as I moved across the floor with Melissa in my arms. When the last note died down, she kissed me and said, You are no longer a frog, my prince. My reverie was interrupted when she sat down next to me. Thinking about it? She asked. Not at all. Just remembering prom. It's clear, so I see that you are thinking. Yes. This was the path that led us here. More like two or three. Would you like another drink? No. I told the nanny that we would be home by eleven. Okay, I just need to go to the toilet quickly. When I returned, I saw Melissa talking to Carol. Carol said something, and Melissa laughed, and then Bev said something, and Melissa laughed as Carol stuck her tongue out. They all hugged, and I marveled at the friendship that had lasted for over eighteen years from sixth grade until today. I had a lot of friends and good buddies, but I couldn't remember anyone who was as close to me as Melissa, Bev, and Carol. I walked up and hugged my wife. Good night, everyone, I said as Carol and I turned, walked out, and headed home. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.